All right, open your Bibles to Psalm 67. Thank you, Brother Dylan. We uh, had a church pick us up for support because they met my son, Ryan. So my wife and I went by to visit the church, and they dropped us. And so uh, <laughs> I, was just like, I figured out if a uh, church picks you up because they met your kid, don't go mess it up, you know, and then have them meet you. But uh, I am very proud of our kids. We have great children. God's been merciful to us to not give us children like ourselves, or at least like me. So uh, we've been very, we're very, very thankful for that. And, uh, uh, of course, Blake is in Oklahoma uh, serving as youth pastor uh, there. Ryan here. Uh, Radi, uh, I'm afraid to say she might just have to go wherever Austin Cowling takes her. So... And that could be scary. I don't know where that might be. But, uh, uh, but I'd rather have my children far away from me in the will of the Lord than close to me out of God's will. And uh, I know that we have some missionary friends whose children are not doing well. And we've talked to them, and it's a heartache. And, and it's very hard to be far away from your children when they're struggling. And when they're not doing well. And it's a great comfort to us that they are doing well. So try not to trip them up, okay? Try to help them along the way and encourage them. We'd appreciate that very much. I want to give you a little update on what's going on with us. Uh, somebody said to me this morning, that the first time they'd seen me, how long are you in town for? Well, I said, well, we're getting ready to go, you know? So we came back the beginning of May. Um, Becky and I did. And uh, we came back for mainly for Blake's wedding. Uh, and then there was a... Uh, an engagement that happened just a little after that. We've been planning a wedding for next year uh, for uh, Rod D. I'm gathering Christmas gifts for Austin. Uh, most of them are explosive, so he can play with them. <laughs> so so uh, he's played with things like that before and not killed himself, but we'll see what happens uh, this year. So um, next year we are planning another wedding, so Lord willing we'll be back uh, next summer as well for that. And... Um, uh, we've got to visit a few churches uh, while we've been home, and uh, Lord willing, we'll be leaving August 6th. And so the building uh, that the church has been building in Cambodia has continued to go forward. They've made lots of progress while we've been gone, and uh, Pastor Wang sends pictures a lot. He sends uh, pictures to everyone that's in the church. There's a Facebook page, and then sometimes he sends individual pictures to me, and that's when I know he thinks there's a problem. And so I get to look at those and uh, we've been trying to figure those out through uh, phone calls and things like that, and he has solutions. So, uh, you know, of course, when there's a building project going on, uh, the details just need to be ironed out as we go. So uh, we're encouraged by what's going on. I think um, maybe Pastor has told you, and I've told a couple of you, but since December, our church in Cambodia has given over $42,000 to the building program. And um, we, were, we were in a place where we were stuck, and I had to tell... Uh, the builder, uh, we're done, we can't go any farther, we don't have any money. Uh, one of the people that works with him is a Christian, and he said, well, you seem to trust God. And I said, I will, I am trusting the Lord to give it, but I also can't boast of tomorrow. I can't order something I don't have money for. And uh, so we, uh, we left the office, and it looked like uh, work was probably going to stop in the next few weeks. And then the next week after that, Pastor Wang and Pastor Sakon each brought in $10,000. And so it was, it was a huge blessing. I knew that they had a desire to do that. Uh, they were trying to sell some land. And um, the thing is, when COVID hit, all that stopped. And no one expected anyone to buy anything until uh, COVID was over. And, uh, but that, those sales went ahead and went through. And um, another church member sold a piece of property and gave a large chunk also to the uh, land fund, the building fund. And so we're just thankful, Lord, for our people, uh, for the leadership of Pastor Sakan and Pastor Wang there. And so pray for the church uh, to continue to go forward in their building, but more importantly, in their faith and uh, help us to reach people in that area. And so we just really appreciate your prayers for that. Again, I said, uh, Lord willing, my wife and I will go back on August 6th. We have a number of things to all get synchronized and uh, one of those is an insurance that's from the country there. And uh, so we found out that um, they're not offering that until August 1st. So we were going to arrive about two hours before August 1st. And I decided to go ahead and wait so we can get that. But also our COVID test. We have to have a COVID test 
uh, within 72 hours of departure. And the problem is they tell you, well, it's three to 10 days to get results back. So we don't know when those results will come back. So we're gonna take a shot at it this week on Thursday morning, try to get uh, COVID test results back at the right time. And if they don't, if they come too early, we'll have to do it again and uh, try again. And so uh, pray about that. Pray that we get, uh, pray that we don't have to get COVID tests like six or seven times trying to get that in the right uh, time period. But we'd like to do that just once. When we get to the country, we, we are taken to quarantine and they'll test us again. If anyone on the plane has COVID, then they'll quarantine us in government quarantine for 14 days, the whole plane load. And so after that, uh, we get another test on day 13 and we can get out. And so if we, no one on the, ten, on the plane has COVID, then we can uh, go home and be quarantined there. The problem is we live at the church and there's not really a, a good place to quarantine. So we're still trying to figure all that out, but pray for us as we go back. There's only about 200 cases of uh, COVID total in the country. So we haven't had a big problem there, but they're trying to prevent it. Psalm 67, Psalm 67. Uh, I was very happy that uh, Pastor Scott didn't mention that I was preaching tonight. At least I don't think he did because I knew Brother Treadway would not be back. Only time he's heard me preach is at camp when I preach for two hours. And so uh, Brother Treadway, I just want you to know, I don't preach for two hours here. I only preach for one hour. And when I'm here at First Baptist, okay? I think there might've been a couple times I preached over an hour, but usually not, usually not. So Psalm 67, and you'll notice because there's very little laughter that I speak the truth, okay? I speak the truth. In Psalm 67, we'll talk about that passage in just a moment, but I want to set up some context. The context that I want to set up is basically the whole Bible. And, uh, you know, many times we think of missions as being something that uh, started in the New Testament and going into all the world to reach all nations and all countries. But God's purpose has always been from the very beginning to reach the whole world with the gospel. In the, in the beginning, you see in the book of beginnings in Genesis, when God called Abraham out and the 11 chapters before Abraham give us the history of the world. Uh, evolution doesn't understand the history of the world, but, but this gave us the history of the world and helping us understand where languages came from and you know, why uh, there are, uh, um, where, uh, how the world was created and, and different things like that. But in chapter 12, when God called Abraham, he blessed Abraham, told me he's going to have a child and that child would become a nation. But that blessing upon Abraham was not only for him and his children or his seed. It was for all nations. As a matter of fact, when it said that by thee or by thy seed, all nations shall be blessed. In Galatians, it helped us understand better exactly what God was telling Abraham. And in Galatians chapter uh, 3, verses 8 and 9, it says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And then in verse 9 it says, So then they which shall they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And so God preached the gospel to Abraham. From the very beginning, God had a plan and a purpose that he would take the gospel and his salvation was for all people. Sometimes as you read the Old Testament, you might think that salvation was only for the Jews, but over and over again, you'll see that that's not the case. It was for everyone. And here in uh, Revelations, all the way to the end of the Bible, in chapter 7, verse 9, this is right after the passage where uh, God's foretelling of the 12,000 of each tribe of Israel that will be witnesses in the end times. But then it says after that, outside of the 144,000 chosen witnesses of Israel, it says this, it says, after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb. Here is a multitude that no one could number. They just numbered 144,000. There's a lot more people than that. And then before God in heaven, all of these people of all different nations, all different skin color, ethnicities, all different uh, native languages, 
All these people will be standing before God. I'm not sure if we'll all be praising God with one tongue or one language or if we'll all have our own native language that we'll be praising God with. But there at that time is going to be a great crowd of people praising God. Now, God has already established that this will happen. The purpose of God is going to be accomplished. He started it before the foundations of the world when he decided that the Lamb of God shall be slain for our sin. And then in uh, chapter 12 of Genesis, he told uh, Abraham that it was going to be through him. There's going to be a Savior come through his seed, through the people of Israel. And we see that this is accomplished, so salvation to the world at the end of time. God's going to bring all nations and all kindreds to heaven. Now, not every person of those nations is going to be there. But this is the purpose of God. He wants to save everyone. God is no respecter of persons. So our text in Psalm 67 says, God, be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. This sounds like a pretty common prayer. Uh, Buddhists pray this prayer to their God. Bless us. I don't know how Muslims pray, but I'm sure they pray for God's blessing upon their life. It's pretty common for people to go to their own gods and ask their gods to bless them. But verse 2 is uncommon. Because there's a reason behind asking God's blessing. That thy way may be known upon earth. Thy saving health among all the nations. The reason the psalmist is asking for God's blessing is so that God's way can be known. Verse 3, let the people, that's all the people of all the nations, let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase. And God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. And all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this passage. Lord, I pray you'd help me to communicate your word, your way. Lord, there's a lot of speaking that's about to be done. Lord, I pray it would not just be my voice that's heard by the people here. I pray you would speak. And I pray people would listen to you. Lord, keep me from saying anything shouldn't be said. But help me say, Lord, all that you would have said today through me. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, there's a greater purpose than you and me. There's nothing in my life that's greater than the purpose of God. I have plans. I have some things I'd like to accomplish. Some are things I'd like to do for God. I don't know if he'd like me to do them or not. We'll see. (laughs) Sometimes I uh, tell people, people say, what are your plans? I say, well, just a minute. Let's get ready for God to laugh as I tell you what my plans are. Because he's going to laugh, I'm sure. But the greatest thing to live for is God's purpose. Now, often we pray for blessing, and I think that's okay. But we need to remember that our lives are for the glory of God. For Christ's sake, the Bible says, and the Gospels. And so as we pray for God's blessing, the blessing is not the end. A blessing is the means. God's, God's blessed you. If you don't think God's blessed you, then you need to back up and count God's blessings. But God has blessed you. And it's okay to ask for more blessing, but it's not okay to ask those blessings just, as the Bible says, to consume it upon your own lust. But for God to enable us to give us wisdom to give us ability, to give us even the finances we need to accomplish his purpose. Now, 
God has a great purpose and, and we want to be a part of it. And the very first thing we can do to be a part of it is be saved. And I want to say if, if you're not saved, if you don't know Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, if, if you still think that it's by good works you can get to heaven, you're mistaken. It's only through Jesus Christ. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. As, as uh, Brother Dalton just uh, saying, what a Savior. Uh, not, not what a great amount of good works I've done for him. No, what a Savior we have. And you need to put your faith fully in him. And if you have not put your faith fully in Jesus Christ, you will not have a place in heaven, as I read in Revelations, praising the Lord. It's going to be a great day. But the only way to be there is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Not by being a member of a church, not by uh, doing a lot for some religion, not by giving to charity, not even by being a missionary, but by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, God wants to save all nations, and he wants to bring them to himself. And as children of God, and uh, Brother Scott talked about that this morning, and what a great privilege it is to be his child. But as a child of God, we can have a part of bringing his purpose to fruition. God desires to use you, and God desires to use me. As a matter of fact, I know, I feel like a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir because God has already used you so much. It was through this church I got saved. It was through the people in this church that I was encouraged to continue coming to church. I was surprised. I remember as a young boy and uh, people coming to say, man, glad you came back to church this week. I'm like, oh, you remember that I was here last week? Yeah, you got saved last week. Praise the Lord, you came back this week. I remember people just encouraging me. I remember sitting in Sunday school classes. I remember my Sunday school teacher one time saying, boys, if you don't do what God has for you to do, there will be cities without churches. There will be countries without the gospel. It, it grabbed me because God had already spoken to me about going to the mission field, but I realized my Sunday school teacher was more burdened for me to do God's will than I was. And it got a hold of me. This church has already had a lot to do with bringing the nations to Christ. Missionaries that have come through, and I remember Pastor Willette, when I was a child, said, let's give $1,000 to that missionary. I thought, man, I want to be a missionary, you know? <laughs> <laughs> now, I was, uh, I just remember all the gifts and the money and sacrifice and testimonies during stewardship time of what people gave, and I was amazed. This church has already had an incredible influence on people coming to Christ. But I want to encourage you. I know there are some people here that maybe uh, are newly saved. There might be some people here who uh, have took a, taken a step back from what you were doing to helping accomplish God's purpose. There may be some people here who've gotten kind of in a rut. Maybe somebody here that God's been talking to you and he wants to speak to you some more. And there may be somebody here who's kind of gone cold. You know, there's three things I want to talk to you about that you need to do, we need to do, to help and be a part of accomplishing God's purpose. And we're going to, uh, first of all, it's going to be, we have to love who God loves. Um, seems to be a lot of hate in our country right now. Uh, people in Cambodia don't understand uh, what they see on the news. I don't either. Uh, sometimes, of course, the news is, tries to slant things. And, however, there is a lot of hatred. The, the Bible says that God so loved the world. Well, we've already established that throughout the whole Bible. It's always been God's purpose to save the nations. That heaven become the home of nations. That there be people of every tongue, every language, every, every skin color there praising him. That's his purpose. And sometimes people allow skin color to get in the way. Sometimes we allow, um, you know, 
things that have happened to us personally. I remember there was a, uh, my wife and I were counseling a young lady. This was early on, probably 2000, 2001. And I knew she was struggling with some things, so my wife and I sat down and talked to her. She was probably 19, 20 years old. And uh, I started to talk to her a little bit, and she said, all men are wicked. I'm like, okay. If something's wrong, all men are wicked. And I said to her, I am a man. And she turned and looked at me with a scowl, and I said, she said, I know. It's like, okay. I turned to my wife and said, I think I'm done here. Uh, I think I'm in the way right now. My wife kind of nodded her head. I left. The young girl had been through some terrible things that caused her to hate men. Now, she had reason to be bitter. Humanly speaking, she had reason for hatred. People, the men very close to her in her life had, had pretty much all of them that I know of, had done terribly wrong. But God wants us to love all people. And sometimes there's things that happen to us when we're young. Sometimes there's things that happen to us in our life. The exposure we have to different, maybe ethnic groups in the world that cause us some prejudice and some bias. In Cambodia, you know, we got there in 1996, and we didn't really understand the makeup of the country and the demographics and everything, but we'd run into Vietnamese people sometimes, and they would speak Khmer, and we could talk to them, and we found out that some of them were born in Cambodia and had already lived through the Khmer Rouge and somehow made it through without the Khmer Rouge finding out they are Vietnamese because the Khmer Rouge killed all the Vietnamese that they found. And we knew there was some of that, but in 1998, there was a riot. There was a protest, and it was an anti-Vietnamese riot. They burned tires around the uh, Friendship Monument, which is friendship between the Cambodian and Vietnamese government. And there was a riot throughout the city, and basically, if you were Vietnamese, you were in big trouble. Many Vietnamese were beaten up. Some were killed. It was a terrible time, and I remember speaking to our church back then, just a baby church, brand-new Christians, and telling them that God is not pleased for us to hate Vietnamese people. I was informed by many different people that I didn't understand the history between Cambodia and Vietnam, and that the Vietnamese had done terrible things to the Cambodian people, and I I didn't know what I was talking about. And I had to confess, I really didn't have a clue. But I did know this, God commands us to love everybody. I mean, I know history, but I knew the Bible. 2003, um, I think Ryan and the kids may remember this one a little more. 1998, Ryan was only two years old. But in 2003, there was another riot. This time, a Thai actress had said something stupid. And just in case you didn't know that actresses in Thailand say things stupid too, just like the actresses in America, okay? So an, an actress in Thailand said something really stupid about a monument in Cambodia should have actually belonged to Thailand. And people just went crazy. They started rioting. and uh, I remember being on the streets one time, a bunch of motorcycles drove up to a a shop I was at, and they, all this big group of men just came in, and they started tearing down posters, anything that had any Thai actors or actresses or models on them, Anything that was a Thai brand, there's tearing all these advertisements down. I was like, man, these people are kind of mad. And I'm translating from from Khmer, Ryan Chikuit. I think mad, right? Like rabid dogs. And uh, <clears throat> about two days later, we're standing on our balcony and we can see fires throughout the city. Now, these are big fires. We can see the flames going up over top of other buildings and numerous places in the city. And my wife and I are very careful people. We're very safety conscious. So we decided to get into our very small car. It was like a Chevette and go see what was going on. And uh, um, of course, we piled as many people in the car as we could. And as we went down the streets, we could see it looked like a war zone. And pretty soon we saw soldiers. And they were piling out of these things. And... And uh, a soldier with an with a automatic weapon, I'm not sure what it was, but he stopped the car and he came up and said, 
where are you going? And I said, I'm going home. Well, the kid said, Dad, you lied to the guy. I said, no, as soon as he asked me where I was going, I decided we're going home. <laughs> we're going home. <laughs> I, I decided right then. They burned the Thai embassy down. That's an act of war. They were crazy. They killed one person. They beat up a lot of people. The day after that riot, we had, we had an institute, and there were about three or four college-age kids there. Pastor Sakon was there with a number, about two or three other older people. Pastor Sakon was probably 50. 50 is not that old, really, anymore. It's, uh, it's kind of young now, but it seemed old back then. But uh, anyway, I said, what do you all think about what happened last night? One of the college-age kids said, those Thai people got what they deserved. This is Christian person in my church studying Bible institutes. <laughs> I was like, wow. A couple of the other college students were just like, yeah, 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 they got what they deserved. I said, Pastor Khan, he was quiet. What do you think? He said, well, I've never found in the Bible where God allows us to hate anyone. Those three college students got whiplash so fast, looked at him, what? And I just let him talk. Thai people have done some terrible things to the Cambodian people. Through the years, there's been wars. During the Khmer Rouge, they would pick up people who were going to the refugee camps, and they'd take them around to the border into a valley, and they called it Death Valley because in that valley were uh, many landmines, and they drop those Cambodians off and send them back into the forest, back to their own country, and the way to get across, and I've talked to some people who did it, was to step on dead bodies. Because the only way they knew there wasn't going to be a landmine there. Sometimes people have, they have reasons for hatred. But God, he commands us to love. We have to love who God loves. And God loves everybody. There was a young man named T., uh, T just lived down the road. His cousin, Sochieta, had gotten saved, and Sochieta's mom had gotten saved. T and their, his brother, Moni, lived in the same house with Sochieta and uh, her mom, and uh, Moni had accepted Christ. And I was talking to T, and I was praying for him to get saved, and I thought, he is close. He's going to get saved. I was headed to his house to do another Bible study, and I really thought, he's going to get saved today. As I reviewed things with him about the gospel... Uh, T said, Pastor, God loves everyone, right? Yeah, God loves everybody. And he pointed at his neighbor, lived right next door, and there was trouble between his family and that neighbor family. He said, does God love my neighbors? He said, yeah, God loves your neighbors. So you're saying God would save my neighbors if they asked Jesus to save them? I said, if they believe in Jesus Christ, God will save them too. He said, then I don't want to believe in Jesus Christ. I told T, T, God doesn't hate who you hate. And if he hated them, you'd be in trouble. Because God's, the mercy that extends to you is what extends to them. He couldn't accept Christ. He said he couldn't accept a God who would love his neighbor. He had reasons to hate his neighbors, humanly speaking. He rejected the gospel because... God didn't agree to hate who he hates. And I'll tell you, church family, God commands you to love who he loves. And he will not hate who you hate. And it doesn't even matter what they've done. God loves them. And God wants all of us to love who he loves. And he loves the nations. He loves people of every skin color, from every country. And you know, a lot of those people have come to America. That's why they call us a melting pot. And all those prejudices that are in Cambodia, the Cambodians that have left Cambodia, they bring those prejudices with them. And they do that. That's why us of German ethnicity tend to tell Polish jokes. What happens? We bring that with us. But God is no respecter of persons. 
The second thing God wants us to do is he wants us to desire the things that he desires. He wants us to love the people that he loves, and he wants us to desire the things that he desires. Now, I want you to go back to our text. I want you to see a couple things here. As this psalmist prays, God bless us that we may, uh, that thy way may be known upon earth and thy saving health among all nations. You know, it is God's will that his salvation, that his way, that the Lord Jesus Christ be made known among all the nations. God wants salvation to be broadcast, whether it be on live stream on the internet or whether it be on the radio or on TV, or if we want to put it in, in print on a piece of paper, God specifically loves to use human beings speaking the gospel to other human beings. I know we don't do that very much anymore. We don't have that face-to-face -face contact. I mean, Lord willing, one of these days we'll get back out on the streets and go soul winning when we can. But God wants us to make his way known. God wants us to have a desire like he desires for the whole world to know the gospel, for your neighbors to know the gospel, for your family to know the gospel. God wants us to have a desire that people understand his salvation and his grace and his mercy that's been extended to them. And there are a lot of people that don't understand. Some of them go to church. Some of them go to Buddhist pagodas. Some of them go to Muslim mosque. Some of them make offerings to their ancestors at a spirit house in their own house. But God desires for all people to understand his way of salvation. And God wants us to have that desire too. He wants us to desire in verse 3. It says, let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. It says again in verse 5. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. For when people come to salvation and when they get saved, you know what happens next? They give praise to God. They give praise to God with their lips. And they give praise to God through their life. And they give praise to God through their service to him. And people praise God after they get saved. Their lives are supposed to be for the praise of God, for the glory of God. That's what God wants. He wants people to glorify him. First, to know salvation, and second, to give praise to his name. I desire to see people in Cambodia not just get saved, but to praise our God, to bring glory to him. It's, uh, it's fun to hear stories in Cambodia when our people are living a consecrated life and following the Bible, and people come ask them, what are, why are you so different? Well, I'm a Christian. Why do your kids obey? How do you do that? One guy said to me one time about Ryan. I don't have this anymore, but he said, it looked like you had a remote, and when you told Ryan to be quiet, boom, he would just be quiet. I lost that remote. It's no longer there. <laughs> if someone finds it, please let me know. Okay? Caitlin wants it, I think. <laughs> Ryan would go out soul with me, and i just tell him, sit still and be quiet, and he, he would. I know it's hard to believe, but yeah, he would. And my people would start to live for the God and train up their children, and people would say, how come your kids don't stay out late at night? How come they're not going to parties? What's going on with your kids? How do you do that? And through their lives, through their families, they bring praise to God. God wants us to have a desire that people get saved and that their lives bring praise and glory to our God. Pastor Howell preached last month about the mission of this church. Number one, to save souls, to convert people to faith in Jesus Christ. And number two, to transform lives. As people are saved, their lives will be transformed and their lives will bring glory to God. And number three, I believe he said, to reach the whole world. Reaching the whole world is what? Getting people saved and having their lives transformed as well. Verse 4, you see in our text, Psalm 67. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. You know, <clears throat> God really does desire for people to be full of joy. Sometimes when maybe we're in a trade war or maybe we're in an actual physical war and there's battles, sometimes... Uh, we allow ourselves to start to hinder some bitterness and hatred towards 
certain groups of people, countries. I tell you something, right now it seems to be China. When I talk to people, China's getting the brunt of most of the world's hatred right now. Not to say they don't deserve it, humanly speaking. In Cambodia, that's the new target for the Cambodians. 2018 and 2019, more than 200,000 Chinese people moved into Cambodia. A town of less than 50,000 people became a town of over 100,000 people, nearly 150,000 people, all the new residents were Chinese. Complete apartment buildings in Phnom Penh, full, all Chinese. Korean missionaries kicked out of their apartment because a Chinese company just rent, came and rented the whole thing. And the Cambodian people, they started to talk, and, and man, these Chinese people are trying to come in take our country over. I said, maybe. That might be what they're trying to do. But I told them, in China, you cannot freely preach the gospel. And in Cambodia, we can. So maybe God wants us, as these Chinese people come to our doorstep, to figure out how to give them the gospel. Well, then the attitude of the church started to change. Hey, we could reach Chinese people. Doesn't work very well yet when you don't speak the language and they have no desire to speak Khmer, but... But that's what we should desire. And then you know what we should desire? That when they get saved and they start bringing glory to God, that God helps them know the joy that can only come through knowing Jesus Christ. And that these people start to sing a praise to God and they be filled with the joy that they can sing with joy to our God with us. And I don't want people to be miserable. But if there's suffering that comes, I'm going to pray that God uses it to bring them to him. So we should love who God loves. We should desire what God desires. And, and then we need to work for what God has always been working for. We need to pray. The Bible says that, first of all, supplications, prayer, intercessions, and giving thanks be made for all men. Who will have all men to be saved? Verse 4. God wants us to pray for everybody to be saved. You know, sometimes if I can give you just a, a couple uh, suggestions about how to pray for the world, for missionaries. For missionaries, as my friend Stephen Benefield has uh, taught me to pray and has uh, often taught a lot of churches, is pray, first of all, for missionaries to arrive. Eric and Jackie Turnbull haven't arrived yet. I mean physically to the country. I know they haven't arrived spiritually. They're a long ways away from that. <laughs> but they haven't arrived in Cambodia yet. Pray for missionaries to arrive. But after they get there, they need you to pray for, pray for them to survive. There are missionaries right now in Cambodia struggling to survive. Uh, my wife and I have been on the phone with uh, more than one couple there who really is struggling. One couple actually is leaving the place they're at. They're pulling back because there's too much isolation, and their pastors told them to m move closer to a better missionary, and they've called and asked if they can move closer to Becky and I. So we're talking to them about where they should be and what they should be doing, and soon I'll be talking to his pastor Another missionary family who basically is just ready to go. And they're really struggling with real life issues that is really difficult in a town where there are no other white people whatsoever and they get treated like maybe they're with the CIA. People don't trust them. Pray for missionaries to survive, pray for missionaries to thrive. Because we're not going there just to survive <laughs> we're going there for the gospel's sake pray that we get past that survival mode and we can start telling people about christ and people getting saved pray for it pray pray for countries when countries are in the news and there's things that are happening when there's a tsunami pray for the christians who are there i know most of them are muslims most of them are spiritists most of them are buddhists but there's christians there too pray for the gospel to be lifted up Pray for the Christians in that place where they're suffering to use the opportunity to bring people to him. Pray for the nations, generally speaking. Pray for people to be saved. If God brings Iran to your mind, pray for Iranians to come to Christ. Well, how's that going to happen? I don't know, but God's a whole lot bigger than we are. Yeah. He can do things that you and I can't. But God commands us to pray. 
We want to be a part of this work. I believe there's going to be people that are saved and in heaven because of the prayers of church members here and other churches who've prayed for missionaries and who've prayed for countries and prayed for people to be saved. And we're going to get to heaven and you can say, this guy, you prayed for him. You didn't know his name. You didn't know where he lived. You didn't know his address, but you prayed for him. Pray. All of us can have a part in that. Give. There's a missions program here in this church. Give to missions. The Bible says, and Paul said to them about missions, can be not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. You see, God's going to accomplish this purpose. When um, we've had a couple things happen in Cambodia, and, and uh, I told uh, Pastor Sakon it looked like, you know, uh, with COVID and everything, we probably weren't going to get very much help from America. Pastor Sakon said more than once, uh, God does not need America. God doesn't need America to give us a building. There was a missionary, and there's some missionaries who are a little bit confused on this. And one missionary, a friend of mine, he, he said, you know, God's not going to punish America because of how much America gives to missions. I said, I think you're a little confused here. This isn't an insurance policy. And, and maybe, maybe God's going to take America out and continue to do missions work just to show that he can. He can do that too. Don't worry, I'm not praying for God to judge America. I'm not praying anything like that. I pray it comes after we're gone, after the rapture. That's what I, I desire. But God's will be done. But we, when we give, we get to be a part of God's purpose. We give our fishes and our loaves to God and he multiplies them. God does things that we could never know. And again, God gives fruit to our account in heaven. I have no idea what that accounting book looks like, but it has to be really complicated. I think God's the only one who can keep that account. But God does. And when you give for, to First Baptist Church, you enable Pastor Howell and the staff here to be able to do the work of God. They're not bound by, by not enough money to go out and print what they need to print and televise what they need to televise and get things on the internet like they need to. And they're not bound by that. When you give, you enable the church here to go out and reach more people. When you give to missionaries, you enable them to get to the, get to the field sooner. You enable them to survive. You enable them to do things that they can thrive on the mission field. And God knows what you give and God knows uh, what it's about. He, he sees the widow who gives a mite or two mites and God uh, takes that and counts and says she gave more than the people who gave all these riches. Uh, God's accounting system is very complicated, but he knows where you're at. And all you have to do is obey him. All you have to do is give what he tells you to give. And you get to be a part of this great purpose. Lord, bless us that thy way may be known upon the earth. And we need to go, you know, go you therefore and teach all nations, every ethnic group. I'm so glad that I got saved and have been a part of a church since my salvation that has welcomed people of every color. I wish I could say that every church I visited through my endeavors as a missionary was like that. But it's not. There are, are a few churches that are more, you could say, like ours. But there's a lot more that are not. May, may that never be the case about First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. But we need to go and tell people about Christ. And there's one more thing here we need to prioritize. The priority is not the blessing. The priority is what we're going to do with the blessing. And that's further God's work and further his purpose. Um, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. Sometimes we put conditions on God. Lord, let my kids serve you as long as... 
I'm thankful for uh, missionaries that have been sent out of this church. Uh, Becky and I were, as far as I know, the first missionaries sent from this church. And then, uh, of course, Patty Mitchell and, of course, John Summer made her change her name. And I'm sorry about that, brother. I'm starting to understand the hurt now because next year, you know, my daughter has to change her name. So, But uh, Patty and John Summer from our church. Rebecca Chernick. You know, Hannah Evans' sister in Spain now and growing up here. Rebecca Nada, who's in Japan, and I can never remember if her husband's James Scott or Scott James. You know, we have two first names. <laughs> in Japan, she influenced and in, in growing up here in Sunday schools and school and influenced by you, sent out. Turnbull's, Beth Turnbull's sister. I can't remember her first name, but she's in Madagascar now. We have people that have grown up and, and left here and gone places, and there's more than a couple. James Zenker, I'm not sure if he was ever from here. I don't know if we ever owned him, Brother Aaron. We were always afraid to own Brother James Zenker, but he was in England for quite a while. But it's, it's not enough. And I can't help but to believe, and a few weeks ago, forgive me, there were just a whole smattering of children. And the first thing I thought was, wow, we have so many young children who are responding to God and tender and coming to the altar. The Lord work in their hearts and call some of them to be missionaries. I know what every, all of you are going to be like, man, I don't want my kid to go on the altar. Brother Rupel's here anymore. I'm be praying over my kids. I don't know who's supposed to go to the mission field. God does. But he wants you to be willing to let your kids go. And so, Lord, use my kids as long as, no conditions. Pastor Sakon and his wife, Ming Samat, oh, they have just been incredibly special people in our church. And I don't know what time it is, by the way, but I'm about done. <clears throat> um, and Ming Samat come every weekend, Wednesday, and Ming Samat sits to my right. Of course, we don't stand this high up at our church, but she sits to my right and almost every time, right in front of the piano. And... Uh, she raised her hand one, one year. She said, Pastor, pray for it to rain. Our rice fields are dry. Dry rice fields are a bad thing. They need lots of water. Our rice fields are dry. They've been dry for a while. We need rain. Okay, let's pray for rain. Next week, they come back and make some out raising their hand. Pastor, pray for rain. Your rice fields are dry. Yeah, they're starting to get scorched. Third week, she raises her hand. I said, pray for rain, right? I'm pretty smart. It only took me three times. <laughs> she says, no, pastor, pray for it not to rain. Well, why is that? We haven't had any rain here. You've had rain at your place? No, we haven't had any rain. And the rice field's really bad. It's scorched bad right now. And if we don't get rain really soon, it's all going to die. But pray for it not to rain. I said, Ms. Amount, why would we pray for it not to rain? She said, because they've been gathering money in our village and they have a couple costumes they put on and they stand way up in the air like 10 feet tall with these heads on these costumes and they play this music and they go around the village and they gather money together and they use that money to offer, spirit, uh, to offer uh, offerings to spirits or to rain. And she said, Pastor... I don't want them giving any praise to those spirits. Pray for it not to rain. I said, think some your rice fields are going to die. All your rice is going to die. She said, let it die. But let people not give praise to those spirits. They're false gods. You know, sometimes, maybe, God is glorified through us not being blessed. So 
Sometimes God's glorified through us having some trouble. And the only thing we could pray about is for God to take away the trouble. And we forget his purpose of saving the nations and bringing them to praise God. Bringing true joy to their life, whether they have all of the modern amenities or not. Because our prayer is not just for God's blessing. Our prayer is for God to be glorified. For his purpose to be accomplished. I've said this already. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. And I know that this church has been used so much already for world missions. But don't lose sight of what's really important. Don't lose sight of how God can use you as a church wholly together. And don't lose sight of how God can use you individually. God wants to accomplish his purpose. And he wants you to be a part of it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy upon us, for saving us. I thank you for allowing us to be used. I thank you for allowing us to be a part of a, a greater purpose, Lord. Something greater than anything this world offers. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for this church. I thank you for Pastor Willette and for Pastor Howell who've led this church to accomplish your purpose. I pray you'd help this church to continue forward. Continue to accomplish the purpose you have for them. In reaching this city, this state, this country, and this world. We're working our hearts. Show us what you'd have us do. We need your help. And the head bowed and eyes closed. If the Lord has touched your heart and spoken to you about something, and you'd like me to pray for you, just raise your hand and I'll pray for you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you don't know today, if you died, you'd go to heaven. You're unsure. The Bible is very clear about how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. And if you don't know for sure you're on your way to heaven, I'd like to pray for you. Is there anybody like that who doesn't know for sure if you die today, you'd go to heaven? Just raise your hand. Anybody in this room? Anybody watching on live stream? That if you have questions about that, send a text. Call the number that you see on the screen there. The greatest thing you can know is that you're on your way to heaven. Lord, I pray that you would help these who've raised their hands. I pray you'd work in our lives, help us to do more to accomplish your purpose. We do need your help. I pray you'd help us in Jesus' name. Would you stand? Would you stand? And if, as the piano plays, if God's spoken to you, or if there's something you need to talk to God about, you come, talk to him, pray, surrender, pray for a country.